I'll always be thankful for the sprawling Kansas cornfields for saving my life. Without it, who knows what would have happened to me. I don't like to dwell on it. This story happened nine years ago, back when I was still a stupid kid. My parents and siblings had left for back-to-school shopping, driving all the way down to Wichita. The 45-minute ride there and back did not interest me, so I begged to be allowed to stay home. Mom, I think I'm old enough to decide for myself if I want to go. My cocky 14-year-old self whined. Fine, but you're not getting any clothes. You have my number if you need it. We'll probably get dinner there, so don't wait up. She called while wrangling my two most quarrelsome brothers into the car. Sweet, thanks. I'd never been completely alone before. I mean, Burns was pretty rural. But growing up with five siblings meant I never got to enjoy the privacy that's supposed to come with country life. Hell, the concept was so foreign to me that I spent the first 20 minutes trying to decide what to do. Suddenly, my stomach growled. There was a gas station about 10 miles down the road, far too long to walk, but not too far to drive. My parents only had one car, but they'd spent last year saving up for a golf cart with the idea that it would let us access the distant parts of our property easier. But more often than not, we used it to drive and get snacks. So, in a move that I'm sure Kevin from Home Alone would have loved, I took the cart. I love the way it sprung to life under my touch. I love the silence of the electric engine, the smoothness of the ride. I loved the grip of the wheel beneath my finger pads. I was so distracted by anticipation that I didn't realize that someone had left the golf cart with about a third of its battery left. Dumb kid. I know. I began driving up our dirt road. Before me stretched the gray sky, expansive and all-consuming. On clear nights, we could see every star in the sky. Even though I hated living in the middle of nowhere, I did secretly appreciate the beauty surrounding me. Glistening cornfields, air that was easy to breathe, the splashes of color from wildflowers. I turned onto the main road, one cracked and filled with potholes. For as far as I could see in either direction, there were no cars. I cranked up the speed to an adventurous 15 miles an hour. I was determined to have fun and, with any luck, be back home before sunset. The gas station was a straight shot from here. I could have driven to it with my eyes closed. In the distance, behind me, a black hazy dot slowly appeared. Another car. It wasn't crazy to see the occasional car, but it still made me uneasy. Most drivers were mean. I just put my head down and drove. Behind me, the dot grew larger. After about five miles, the cart began to shut down. No, 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 no. I pleaded the air. This cannot be happening. I pulled over to the side of the road, struggling to think. I was five miles away from home. There was no way I could walk there and back, especially before dark. The sun would start setting soon. Back then, phones were not something a teen just carried around. At least, not middle-class teens. I also hadn't brought any form of protection. And the black dot, a rusted-up van, was still heading towards me, quickly making up the space between us. I felt like throwing up. But then the vehicle was about 100 feet away. It began to slow down. 40 miles... 30, 20, 10, until it was right upon me. It pulled over right in front of the dead cart. A man with a scraggly white beard opened the passenger door. Hello, little lady. Stranded here, are we? His voice was raspy. Like my father, he was a smoker. I was certain. He took another step toward me. Hello. No, I'm just waiting for a friend. I blurted out. 
aware that the lie was stupid even before I'd said it. Here? He responded. Is not the safest place to do that. How about I take you down the road? There's a gas station there. Your friend will find you. He continued walking towards me. I'm not sure if you have room in the car. You weren't the one driving, and you know what they say. Two's a company, three's a crowd. I took a step backwards. At this, he let out a guttural laugh and called to the man still in the car. Gustav, get out here. A man slightly rounder and taller than the one in front of me stepped out. He was as old as his colleague. In his hand, the bottom of a switchblade could be seen. I freaked out. I was caught like a rat in a maze. I was miles away from civilization, and my rescuers were more like assassins. Above me the sky dimmed, behind and in front of me the empty road stretched on. They would catch me in an instant. To my side was a field full of fat, dent corn, the kind you need to livestock. In a few weeks it would be harvested, leaving behind a shockingly empty field, but now, in just a few feet, I could hide myself. Come here. The one with the knife screamed as he lunged toward me. I dashed to the side and into the field of corn. The stalks slapped my face. I moved in random directions, to the left, to the right, closer to what I thought was the road closer to the center. From behind me I could hear them brushing past stalks and cursing. Sometimes their rustling grew louder, sometimes softer. I tried to run as fast and quietly as I could, praying they'd give up. In my rush I tripped over a stalk, skinning my leg in the process. Blood began to fill up the wound and drip over my ankles. I whimpered, intent on staying silent. They moved wildly and at random. Sometimes they would split up, and I'd have to avoid two rustling paths. Then they would come back together again, using their mutual malice as fuel. I'm gonna kill you, the first guy said mere feet away, unable to see past the layers of corn. If he had continued walking in my direction for a few more feet, I would have certainly died the knife tearing up muscle and tendon over and over. I would have been left to be discovered days later by whoever's land I had trampled on. I thought of my parents, who would be sick with grief, and of my younger siblings who would cry at night without me to comfort them, and I thought of the long walk home under the veil of night, and despite my attempts to stay calm, tears came flowing out. I sobbed for what felt like hours on the dirty ground, and when there were no more tears to be squeezed out, I listened for any sign of my attackers. There was none. There was no noise except for crickets, and nothing to see except the small sliver of sky not blocked out by corn. It took me a long time to find the road in the dark. I started in a random direction and got lucky. From what I could see in the gloom of late evening, there was no van. There was no golf cart. I suppose it was taken as a form of collateral damage. I walked home on the edge of the road, just in case another sinister black dot would appear. My clothes were ruined, but for once I didn't care. My skin stung and burned after pushing through so much vegetation. I could see the moon through gaps in the clouds as it rose higher in the sky. In all, it must have been nearly midnight when the first cop car showed up. After that, it was a blur of questions, tears, and the scent of coffee that clung to the Burns police team. My mother held me in her arms, and my father assured me that they weren't mad at me. They had called the police when they'd arrived at an empty house about half an hour before I was found. My parents apologized for being back so late for letting me out in the first place. Everything they said melted together in my mind to create a feeling rather than any solid memory. Unsurprisingly, 
I wasn't the best or most eloquent victim in the world. Yet if anyone thought my story was false or exaggerated, they didn't think so after another girl disappeared a week later. She too had been left alone on a rural road near dusk. I cried when I heard that and wondered why I had survived while she hadn't. I know on a technical level that it's not my fault, but some part of me will always feel like I should have been the last victim, that I should have done more. Sometimes when I'm alone in my apartment on a cloudy evening, I think back to Kansas. I think back to that girl, someone who was just a few years older than me, and I wish so badly that I could tell her to run into the corn without looking back.